<laughs> Let me start again. Yeah. <laughs>
that's how you stand out from the crowd. And the people that, the people that know how to crowdsource, the people that understand how to do that, absolutely have a competitive advantage in this space. Not to mention the fact that production companies, managers, agents, you name it, look at the ability to bring an audience with you as sort of in a weird way as the new IP. You know, a year ago, everything that was in vogue was, is this based on anything? Is this project based on anything? You know, are you bringing an audience that is already familiar with this IP? Well, now it doesn't matter if it's existing IP. What matters is if you've built an audience or groundswell for that product and that project on your own already, people are going to be more likely to say, wow, you've already proven that people like this, that they're interested, and you're going to get more serious looks and more serious attention. And that's why it's monumentally important. I mean, the beauty of the book is that I was able to talk to a bunch of filmmakers and producers, even actors and screenwriters. And I should say that the book is called Crowdsourcing for Filmmakers, but it really is for all creatives. And really, it's for everybody. I mean, even if you have a business or if you have a product, it's only called Crowdsourcing for Filmmakers because Focal, uh, Rutledge, that's what they focus on is, is film. I would have preferred it to be called crowdsourcing for film creatives because everything that we're going to talk about is true for actors, writers, producers, financiers. It doesn't matter. It's all about branding and building that audience and building that support. Um, so I was able to talk to probably 100 to 150 people, at least, that I interviewed for this book and uh, came away with some pretty amazing case studies. There's probably, there's three big ones, actually four big ones in the book, including the story of Stage 32 and how we crowdsource the community. Um, but then three film ones, one's a documentary, one's a short, or one's a feature, to show how these producers crowdsourced everything, not only from their, not just their audience, but locations and camera equipment and you name it. it there are a million different ways to crowd, crowdsourcing the names of characters. I mean, you name it. Um, and that allowed us to have probably about you know, 15 to 20 case studies in all in the book. Some, some are capsules, some you know, short form case studies, and the other are a long form. One of my favorites is a documentary called Mile, Mile and a Half. And it's a really interesting story, and it encompasses everything that we talk about, about audience building, which at the core of crowdsourcing is what we're talking about, is audience building. Uh, but it's also about the fact that you could source anything, and that's what I love about this story. This is a documentary that five cinematographers and one sound engineer decided that they wanted to do. They were all fitness freaks. So they decided that they were going to go on a hike together. They were going to go do a camping thing. And they started thinking about this further, and they said, why don't we go hike the John Muir Trail? And the John Muir Trail is about a 206-mile hike in the Pacific Northwest where you have to get, I think about maybe 50 permits a year where you could hike the whole thing. You could hike parts of it, but to hike the whole thing, you need a special permit. And they said, why don't we go you know, film this thing? Let's take the most state-of-the-art equipment, um, video-wise, audio-wise, and film all these different ecosystems in a way that nev has never been seen before, because most people haven't seen it. It's sort of this thing in America that people don't really know about or they haven't seen it on film. And they said, well, let's go bring that to the public doesn't seem like a really sexy documentary in a lot of ways. And they wanted to go out and they wanted to raise $85,000, which is an enormous number for a documentary for this subject matter. But here's what they did that was really cool. They said, okay, let's think about who the audience is for this film, which should be the first question that anyone should be asking when they're for any project, for any project, any way you should ask who the audience is for this film. And they said, okay, well, we know who's going to really like it. The nature freaks, the health, the health and fitness buffs, uh, the people that love camping, the outdoorsmen, the outdoors women, they're going to love it. But let's see if we could expand that. And they said, you know what? Well, why do we want to do this? Well, we want to do this because we're gearheads, because we love film, we love documentaries. And they said, well, let's go to the people that probably love the same. So they went to all the gearhead boards and everything like that. And they started telling them, look, this, and I'm talking, this is like six months before they even launched the crowdfunding campaign. So this is a long time, okay? And this is why, because audience building takes a long time. But they went to all these different groups and they said, look, this is what we're looking to do. Are we crazy? What should we be thinking about? What should we, you know, how should we, um, you know, they started running contests, for example, like, you know, we're going to be traveling heavy with all the equipment. How do we travel light food wise? What kind of meals can we carry in a camping cup? You know, and people started writing in and what they were doing were, was they were identifying their audience and then engaging and then they were giving them ownership. They were saying, help us, 
you know, be a part of what we're doing. You know, how many miles a day is too much? What kind of footwear should we wear? All of this stuff. And what ended up happening was there was this sort of really interesting groundswell of support that went on. And then what happened, even better, was that some of these people got so behind them, they started writing equipment companies and camping equipment and even, even um, uh, electronics companies and camera companies and saying, check out what these guys are doing. And they started getting contacted by these companies who started donating equipment and donating camping gear. And then REI got involved, of all things. REI is a gigantic outdoors company. They gave them all the equipment. They said, you could take it all. This is so awesome. We're going to write about it on the blog. Just mention us in the credits. Just give us a thank you. And here you go. So they were crowdsourcing equipment. They were crowdsourcing everything. By the time they went to turn on their crowdfunding campaign, six months later, and they finally asked this audience that they identified and they had engaged and who had given value to and ownership to, when they asked them to move, they moved like that. And that $85,000 was raised in four days. I believe it was four days. And they hit their goal that quickly and they surpassed their goal. What was better, and this is a big part of it, they continued to deliver on their promises even after they got into post-production. They didn't just film the movie and then disappear. They were giving them, they were showing them pictures in, in the post-production and giving them added uh, extra you know, scenes that weren't gonna be in the movie. They kept giving value and giving value. When the film finally premiered at the LA Film Festival, they had to open up another theater because so many people showed up. Okay, and that's the first time it's happened in the festival's history. When the movie got released on iTunes, it went to number two in the first day behind Hero Dreams of Sushi. And it is very difficult to crack the top 10 on documentaries, especially day one on iTunes. But this was the ground swell of support. They still, to this day, reach out to everybody, reach out, and they keep talking about the next film. These backers are ready to just run through a wall for them. This is the army of boots on the ground that they built up. And they have a lot of other gear companies still saying, next movie, you tell us what you need. Next movie, you know, whatever you need us to do. That's crowdsourcing at its finest, and that's why I love that story. First thing you gotta do is you have to be honest with yourself. You have to be honest with who your audience is. You know, filmmakers, screenwriters, actors, um, you know, any content creator, we all like to think that, we all wanna be universally loved. We all wanna be, you know, we all we want everybody to love our work and, and love what we do. But the reality of the situation is that there's an audience for everybody and you have to know who that audience is. And that is the single most important part of taking the first step in crowdsourcing. Who is my audience? It's the first question you have to ask yourself. And then you have to, you have to answer it honestly. And that part might be even more harder than really answering the first question honestly, okay? If you think about your favorite film of all time, okay, your favorite author, your favorite piece of art, your favorite anything, is it universally loved? Does everybody else love it? No, the answer is no. You'll find detractors everywhere. And there's reasons why. You know, I love The Godfather. I like mob movies. Other people may not. I like, you know, thrillers and action movies. Other people hate them. You have to know who your audience is and you have to know who you're targeting. And then the second thing is right behind that is you have to know how to engage in a selfless way. What am I going to give? Everything having to do with, with relationship building and audience building begins and ends with the value, not the value that they can give you, okay? That's for later, all right? If you're identifying and you already know what the value proposition is gonna be at the end or what the value ask is gonna be at the end, but they're not gonna come with you if you're not bringing value. So it's all about how do you identify them and how do you engage them in a selfless way? And that's something you can to do today. But the, the bigger thing is the reason why crowdsourcing works and the reason why it you know, is something that is so important is because the people that put in the time, when you build those relationships and you build, it would ultimately sometimes become friendships, sometimes they just become business you know, relationships or whatever, that value carries on for a long period of time. But, it, but it's work and it's why so many people surrender. They don't, they don't wanna put in the work. They just wanna create something and have people see it. And that's not the way it works. It's a long game. It's a long game and you have to be willing to put in the time. Everything on social media begins with being selfless. 
everything. You know, I like to say that when you sign up for a social media account, you're being handed a microphone, but so is everybody else. Everyone's being handed a microphone. The question is, what do you do with it? 95% of the people that get handed that microphone go, ah, and they, you know, look at me, look at me, look at me, ah, and, and that becomes a, you know, just a din, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's like being next to power lines, like, and you know, you don't, nothing, you know, nothing comes through. You like that. Uh, <laughs> nothing comes through. Um, if you're using that microphone to say, here's a really great piece of content that I found that I think you guys will like, uh, thank, you know, engaging with somebody saying, thank you for sharing that piece of content. Thank you for being a part of my network. Hey, you know, I really enjoyed that film you made and here's why. You're making it about other people. You're bringing value to other people. Um, I always say there's three ways that you can, you know, some people say like, I'm not good at social media or I don't feel like I have a place on social media. And my answer is everybody has a place on social media and here are your entry points, okay? Share content, be complimentary, okay? And be grateful. Those are the ways that you can get in, all right? Everyone is accessible on social media. If you're on Twitter, let's say, or even on stage 32 for that matter, you can reach anybody at any time. But the difference between the people that are able to engage other people and those that get uh, radio silence is approach. It's value. It's what you bring to the party. You have to come from a place of selflessness. And if you don't, you can expect that silence. And that's why so many people quit social media because they don't get anything out of it, but they're not bringing anything. And you have to bring something. It's called social media, by the way, not me media. That they don't need to. That if you build it, they will come. Um, a lot of filmmakers just, well, it's not filmmakers. It's, again, it's screenwriters, it's actors, it's content creators of any kind, it's producers. Um, you know, they think their greatness is going to shine through or the, the originality of the project, let's say, or the brilliance in their mind that the project is going to win the day. And look, there is a lot of content out there and there are a lot of really good writers and filmmakers and actors. And, you know, I've heard people say to me on the, let's just take it from, we'll go to a different direction and go into the music business. I've had people say to me, God, I've seen this band so many times and they're so amazing. It's incredible. They never got a deal. They never got anything. But then you go to watch them play and they have five people in the audience because they don't know how to build an audience. They don't know how, and they don't know how to draw attention. Okay. They don't know how to show what they're all about. That is so monumentally important. That's why I'm saying if you could build an audience for you and your brand, and you are a brand, and people don't realize that too, you are a brand. You have to identify what that brand is, and then you have to project that brand forward. Okay, but if you're not doing that, people aren't gonna know about it, all right? Nobody's gonna guess. And you have to give people a reason beyond it's a great film, man. You got to check it out. Or like, hey, I just wrote the greatest screenplay. And I hear this stuff all the time. But there's no proof and there's no social proof of that. And there's no army and there's no champions behind that. And if there's none of that, then it, again, you're going to get radio silence. So it's people think that it's all about the craft. And it's not about the craft. It's about the craft. It is about the craft, but it's about the craft plus knowing the business, knowing the industry, knowing all of it and about your relationships. Relationships are everything in this business, everything. I don't care what craft you're toiling in, I don't even care if you're crew, okay? Relationships are everything, your brand is everything, and how you cultivate that defines you. Look, if you're famous and, you know, the, the, the Josh Whedon or the Zach Braff kind of thing where you could just turn it on because people know who you are, um, sure, you know, people are going to back you because they know you. But that is part of, there was a time where those people had to crowdsource an audience just as well. They've just carried it forward to the point now where they're a brand. Zach Braff is a brand. Josh Whedon's a brand. Um, but for the first time filmmaker, um, the first time crowd sourcer? The answer, in my opinion, is no. Unless you have friends and family, of course, that are going to donate the whole thing, which in that case, you really don't need the crowdfunding aspect of it. But the whole idea behind crowdfunding is that you're sourcing an audience. 
And that's why I don't believe that that's the case. If you look again, we talked about mile and mile and a half or any of these other examples even that are in the book where there was a crowdfunding aspect, you'll see that the common denominator was well before they launched that campaign, they went out and sourced this audience and got them so riled up and gave them ownership of this project to the point where they said, hey, listen, in a few months, we're gonna turn this thing on. Will you take this journey with us? And that's what a really good crowdfunding campaign manager or a person running a crowdfunding campaign, once they identify, engage that audience and engage that audience, they get them to the point where they say, you know, will you take this journey with us? It's not, will you donate? Will you, will you take this ride with us? And if you get people to that point, that's when they want to jump in with you. So I don't believe, I think it's the biggest mistake that people who run crowdfunding campaigns make. And I think it's the reason why so many crowdfunding campaigns fail is because they're not sourcing for months before uh, they start the campaign. And then what ends up happening is they get into desperation mode. You know, they find themselves three weeks in and they're at like 20% of their goal and then they go into social media and then they start DMing you and saying, hey, please back. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. I've had so many people that have hit me up that, you know, you don't have a relationship with them and they just hit you up and they DM you and they're like, oh, you got to check out this project. And then you go and you look at it and, you know, they're in week three and they're at like 7% of their goal. And you could see why, because the strategy is wrong. The people that win the day, and look, I have friends at Indiegogo, I have friends at Kickstarter, I have campaign manager friends that this is what they do for a living. And when they get involved in the project or when the people that head up the film departments at Indiegogo or Kickstarter get behind the project, or even, doesn't even have to be film, when they get behind a tech project, a tech product, they all say the same thing. Don't run before you can walk. Don't press that launch button yet. We're gonna spend three to six months building an audience for this, getting people excited about it, get, giving people ownership of it, okay? And then we're gonna move. Why do you think the reason why so many tech products do better, or the tech product uh, crowdfunding campaigns do better than film on a success average? The reason is people get excited about the product. People that, run, that own these products ask, what features do you wanna see? What else are we missing? What do we, and then what do they give them? They let them pre-order it. So they, they want it, it's tangible. But for a film, it's not tangible. What's tangible is the fact that you feel like you're a part of it, that you feel like you're involved in it, that you feel like you're on set with them when they go to start filming. You know what I mean? Like you're part of this thing. I back that thing and I'm proud of it. That doesn't happen when you just throw up a campaign and then start asking people that you don't know who have no investment and no involvement with you to donate. So yeah, you know, I don't believe that you could have a successful crowdfunding campaign without crowdsourcing. It just doesn't work. It's the brand of you or the brand of your project, I think is what, you, what you're getting at. And it should be the brand of your, if you're a first timer, it should be the brand of your project. Here's how I'm gonna illustrate this, okay? Again, I want you to think about your favorite filmmaker, okay? That man or woman that no matter what they're making, you're going to the theater to go see that film. Okay, I'll give you an example. P.T. Anderson is one of my favorite filmmakers, okay? When Hard Eight came out, I knew nothing about P.T. Anderson. I wouldn't have known P.T. Anderson from any other Anderson on the street. But what I did know and what my friends knew was that I liked independent dramas. They knew I liked gambling movies and movies about, you know, redemption stories. They knew what kind of movie I liked. They knew that this was right in my wheelhouse. So I had friends that were going to film festivals and saying to me, you have to see this movie, Heart Eight. And I went to go see it. And I was like, wow, this is a really, really good movie. But also, as somebody that loves cinema, I said, this is a really good filmmaker. Who is this guy? Okay, and I learned more about him and I knew that that time that he was, you know, whatever he was at the time, 23, 24 years old, and that he had written and directed this thing. And I said, wow, this guy has got some serious chops. So now I went from being a fan of the movie, okay, to a fan of him, not totally yet. I wasn't totally convinced yet because this was one project. And I'm like, okay, let's see what he does next. Well, what he did next, of course, was Boogie Nights. And I went to go see Boogie Nights and I came out of that theater and I said, I don't care what this guy does for the rest of his life, I'm going because now I am a fan of him and the brand of P.T. Anderson, and P.T. Anderson certainly has a brand. It's the same thing with you as a content creator, as a writer, an actor, a producer, a filmmaker, it doesn't matter, okay? At first, it is always going to be about the brand of your work, the project, okay? So if you're a first-time filmmaker, for example, and you're putting up a crowdfunding campaign, 
people are going to back the project because of if you're if you're crowdsourcing correctly the content of the project because you've identified people who are going to be supporters of the content of the project for example I use this in the book, but let's say it's a baseball movie. You're gonna go out to every baseball organization, people, you know, you're gonna hit everybody on Twitter that has shown an affinity for baseball, comp movies, you know, that are in the space. You're gonna go to chat boards and everything else, and you're gonna let them know about what you're looking to do, and then you're gonna give them ownership. You're gonna say, hey, here's a little bit of the plot. What have I missed? What am I doing? You know, hey, I'm gonna name the dog today. I, you know, the dog in the script is an Irish setter. Who wants to name the dog? And you give them ownership. And oh, so-and-so won the contest to name the dog. You get them involved, you get them involved, you get them involved. They're fans of the project. But every step along the way, you are providing them with value. And then you have the opportunity, okay, to deliver on every single promise that you made. I'm gonna make this movie it's going to be exactly the way we talked about. I'm going to bring it in on time. I'm going to send you, like I said, pictures from the set, extras from the set. I'm going to be, you know, interviewing the actors and sending them, saying hi and all this stuff and whatever. And then I'm going to deliver the best film that I can deliver. If you do that the whole way through, guess what happens? They cease to become, well, they'll always be fans of the brand of the film. But now they're fans of the brand of you. And now if your next movie is a 180 from your baseball movie, you know, it's a musical set in, you know, the 1920s, they don't care, okay? They want to follow you into fire. So at first it's about the brand of the project and then it's about the brand of you. And then as you move along, if you continue to deliver on your promise, promises, it's the brand of you, the brand of you, the brand of you, the brand of you, the all the way through. Oh, to the release? That's a great question. Um, well, crowdsourcing has always been sort of inbred in me. When I, you know, I used to run a magazine called Razor that was a men's lifestyle magazine. It competed against GQ and Esquire. And we used a very, because we didn't have the finances or the funding to compete in a lot of ways with the advertising and marketing of a GQ or an Esquire, we relied on our audience to carry the message of our brand, which in a lot of ways was very simply, uh, one of our slogans was when you, you know, dump, raise a magazine is for when you're done with your maximum years, but not ready for your Esquire years. Now, men that read our magazine loved that and they were carrying the message and they were like, you got to check out this magazine. So we were crowdsourcing back then, obviously with stage 32. It's been the same thing. Like I said earlier, this is, you know, stage 32 started with a hundred of my industry friends. And I asked them straight up, I said, look, you're in now, you're a part of this community. Go invite at least five people to come join us to help strengthen this thing. My word of mouth, and this is a big part of crowdsourcing, okay? The word of another in support of you is greater than your word if somebody doesn't know you. So what I was basically saying is, I can go to your colleagues, I can go to your friends, and say, hey, come join Stage 32, but they're gonna be like, who the hell are you? But if you tell them, and you tell them that what I'm doing is worthy of their time, they're gonna say, well, yeah, we're gonna check that out. And that's why we wanted to crowdsource with Stage 32, to ask people to go do that. Well, with this book, it's really been no different. People have known, when I first signed the contracts for this book, and it was about two years before it came out, because it was, again, a ton of interviews and a ton of research, but the day I signed the contracts, I let everybody know, I'm doing this, okay? And here's what I need from you. If you've crowdsourced something before, tell me about it. If you've had a failed crowdfunding campaign, if you can't get traction on social media, if you've quit social media, I wanna know. It wasn't even so much hearing the success stories as it was hearing the failure stories because I wanted to be able to help people who had had those failures on top of knowing that it'd be easier to find the success stories in a lot of ways. I wanted to talk to the people that, you know, had struggled. And what were those struggles? What do you need me to write about? What needs to be in this book? So from day one, from the day I signed the contracts with Focal and Rutledge, it was all about giving people ownership. It was all about going out to people on social media or people in my, you know, I have a pretty big social media following, so going to those people and saying, look, I'm writing this book, I want you to write me privately send me what's going on. You know, if you've had struggles, send them to me. And I started sourcing an audience two years before the book went into play. And, you know, started letting people know as I was writing the book, look, here are some subjects I'm planning on writing on. Here are some chapter titles that I'm working on. What do you think of that? Um, here are, you know, not, here's not only a chapter, but what's gonna be in the chapter 
Is there anything you feel I'm missing under this subject that you feel you know would be helpful or that you've experienced that I'm not covering? And everybody got into it. Everybody was like, wow, this is really, really, really cool. And you had a bunch of confusion with the crowdsourcing crowdfunding thing, but that also gave me the opportunity to educate people, to say like, this is what the book is gonna be about, but lo and behold, and you know, don't, don't fret, there is gonna be stuff about crowds, crowdfunding in the book. You know, and there are two chapters on crowdfunding. Originally, I wasn't going to put two chapters on crowdfunding because I wanted to keep it on the crowdsourcing level. But people were saying to me, if you really believe that there can't be a successful crowdfunding campaign without crowdsourcing, include it in the book. Do a couple of chapters. So I did, but that came from the audience. So, you know, I learned from the early, from Razor and from Stage 32 that this works and this is absolutely important. And I did not want to write this book in a vacuum. I wanted to write it with contributions from Stage 32 members, my Twitter followers, my Instagram followers, everybody, everybody. And uh, there's a lot of everybody in this book, which is great. The amount of things that people sourced at times was a little surprising. Uh, there is another great case study in the book uh, for a movie called uh, Risen Star. And they crowdsource locations. I mean, it's fascinating. They had to shoot, the, the script called for them to shoot at government buildings and places where, especially for a short on a limited budget, um, you know, you don't have a lot of money for locations, to pay for locations, of course, but it's certainly to pay for, you know, to be at government buildings and, and to convince them to let you do that is something else. But they were able to, you know, build up this groundswell of support in the community because it was about, the story was about unemployment and what was going on with people in the area um, to convince government officials to say, you know what, we'll give you the locations, but here's what we want. You know, you premiere this movie at, town, at the city hall. I mean, it's amazing. I mean, it's amazing. But, you know, it was the fact that really anything could be sourced. And it's the fact that, you know, you're only bounded by, your only limitations are really, you know, bounded by the, the, uh, the excesses, I guess, of your mind or the way that your mind, as far as your mind can reach in a way. There's only one solution and that's not to neglect it. You have to know what's going on in the industry. I mean, you have to. Again, for me, look, I, you know, I, I don't want it to be lost on anybody watching this video that I'm not just the founder of Stage 32 and uh, you know, I am an actor, a writer, and a producer, and those things call for me to be in a very competitive space all the time, just like everybody watching this video right now. It is incredibly competitive, no matter what I'm looking to do, whether I'm looking to produce a, a feature or an indie, or I'm trying to get a feature into Sundance like we were, you know, back in 2011 with Another Happy Day. I mean, it's competitive and you know it's competitive. So, and, and I, even as a screenwriter, you know, I'm repped. I have things in development, things are moving along. I mean, the, the, the more than two or three scripts that are, that are moving along doesn't matter, okay? I, I'm still out there being my own best advocate. And the way, but the way I was able to get to those situations and be in that position was because I knew what was going on in the business. I knew who my targets were. I knew who I needed to be talking to. I understood what was happening when I was walking into a meeting. I was prepared at all times. To me, everything is about how do I get a competitive advantage? What gives me a competitive advantage? Everything is about that. So I said earlier, you know, crowdsourcing done right gives you an amazing competitive advantage. Knowing what's going on in the industry gives you an amazing competitive advantage because I could tell you that so many people don't know and so many people don't take the time to know and so many people don't take the time to know who they're dealing with. They get a meeting and they have no idea who they, they, do, they don't do. They research, they don't. You have to know. It, it is part of your job. I don't care, and I don't care what craft you're in, what craft, you know, anything, it doesn't matter. You have to know the business. It would be enormous because the person that reads the book would understand everything that goes into building, that, building an audience and moving an audience, building and engaging and moving them. And it would give them an enormous advantage because the strategies within are not just the strategies that you know, I've used and that I've cultivated through the years and in some ways perfected in a lot of ways, to be honest with you. Uh, and I'd say that with no ego, I'm saying that that's, you know, trial and error, trial and error, trial and error till I got to something that worked, a bunch of getting knocked down, but getting up again, knocked down and up again. 
but it's not just my voice. It's the voices of dozens of filmmakers and producers and financiers and screenwriters within talking about these same things, taking these strategies that I'm talking about and using them in their own way uh, you know, to find success and to be able to crowdsource an audience and in, in you know, relation to your question, raise money uh, for their projects. So it would give you an enormous advantage in my opinion. And I don't think I'm wrong. Yeah, relax, just relax, be yourself, you know, treat your online pursuits. By the way, crowdsourcing is an online and an offline endeavor. Um, they should not be different. The, the benefit of online, of course, is that, you know, you can reach anybody at any time and that's the beauty of it. But that means you also have to put in the time and you have to put in the work. It is work and you have to be willing to do it. And those who, you, I always say you could separate who's serious and who isn't by the people that all they care about is the craft, the craft, the craft, the craft, and they don't worry about all the other stuff that goes around it. Um, you have to relax. You have to have a plan. As we said earlier, you have to know who your audience is. Come up with 30 days of social media posts. Challenge yourself to come up with 30 days of sharing content or whatever. Spend one night saying, you know what? For the next two hours on social media, I'm just gonna go meet people and compliment them or I'm gonna make a target list. And, I'm, and that target list may be 10 people, okay? But I'm gonna have something to say to all 10 of those people that are gonna be about them, that I did some research on, that they're gonna be astonished that somebody knew about me in an effort to engage them, in an effort to get them to know who I am. Challenge yourself all the time. You're not going to get 10 responses in that scenario. You're probably not. But if you get one out of 10, two out of 10, three out of 10, it's still two or three contacts that you can build on. And that's what it's all about. It's building relationships. If you think about your best friendships that you've had in your life or you have in your life, those things took time. It wasn't like you met them one night out somewhere and the next day you were like, oh, we're going to be best friends forever. No, it takes time and it takes trust and it takes you bringing value to the relationship. And that's exactly what social media and audience building is all about. It's also what your online, offline efforts are all about. You don't go to a conference and meet somebody for the first time and you're making a movie with them the next day. It's very rare that that happens, I should say. But, you know, it takes time to build up trust and to, to make the other person understand that you're always going to be bringing value to the relationship. And, uh, but the people that do it win the day more often than not, and more often than not, and my whole goal every single day, when I, my eyes open in the morning, I'm like, how am I going to win today? So that's what you have to think about. How am I going to win today? But just relax and just do it. And don't worry about being judged and don't worry about, you know, put out great content, be a great communicator, come from a place of selflessness, obey the rule of three, which, which the rule of three very simply is, you know, be selfless three times before you ask for anything yourself. Give, give, give before you ever ask for anything. And that first ask should not be for the world. You know, it just might be, can you, I noticed that you know somebody, can you introduce me to them? Can you be, you know, and you're winning champions, okay? But winning champions begins with selflessness. And do that, and I promise you, you'll win more days than you lose. You can find crowdsourcing for filmmakers, which again, I just want to say for all creatives, all business people, I don't care if you're a CEO. By the way, if you are a creative, you are an entrepreneur, you are a CEO, you're the CEO of you. That's very important. Treat your life as a business, treat your pursuits as a business, treat your audience building and relationship building as a business, be the CEO of you. But this is for all creatives. Uh, you can find the book on Amazon. It's available in an ebook and in paperback, obviously. It's also available on Focal Press's site as well. Um, I don't know the exact website for Focal Press, but if you put in Focal Press and crowdsourcing for filmmakers, you'll find it, but it definitely is on Amazon. And if you're watching this overseas, you can go through Focal and a number of other booksellers as well that have the book in stock. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I love Film Courage. Love Film Courage. Thanks for having me back.